Wells disappeared on Thursday, August 3rd, 2006. When a person disappears without a trace, often the most critical information is hidden in their actions and words from the days before they vanished. Brandy Wells' last known whereabouts may hold the clues to what happened to her. The only thing solid is that Brandy's gone. A passionate young woman, about to get a second chance in life, takes a risk in going to an East Texas nightclub alone. She told me she was going to the club to meet some friends. So this was her one last chance to go out and have a little fun, kick it up. I told her, I said, Brandy, please just be very careful. But when her car is found abandoned on a major interstate... No sign of a struggle. There was no sign of Brandy. Did she run out of gas and get picked up by a trucker or did she meet somebody at the club? Investigators race against the clock to piece together the last known steps of Brandy Wells. <laughs> Wednesday, August 2nd, 2006. 23-year-old Brandy Wells is driving 20 miles from where she's living in Brownsboro to her hometown, Tyler, Texas. Before starting a new semester at college, this spirited young woman is on a mission to have some fun. Brandy walked through the apartment door and it shocked me because I was not expecting her, you know, smiled and asked her, well, what are you doing here? And she told me, well, I've come to spend the night with you. It's a welcome surprise for Ellen Wells, who has been sitting alone watching TV after her younger daughter, Georgia, had gone to bed early. My younger daughter was already in bed. She had not been feeling very good that day, so she went ahead and laid down. And it was really nice to see Brandy walk through that door. Um, thinking I was going to get to spend some time with her. Brandy recently moved back to East Texas. She returned to pursue a teaching degree at the community college on a renewed scholarship with the Flag Corps. Just three days before, Brandy called her best friend, Janelle Midkiff, to share her excitement. She couldn't stop talking about getting ready to get back in school because I know that she had missed that and that's really where she was wanting to be. Now, Brandy is trying to re- She had also applied for a new job at Walmart and she was waiting for them to get the space available to put her on the schedule. Brandy shares this news with her godmother, Michelle Cole. I've always called myself Brandy's other mother. So I am her godmother, but I am definitely her other mother. <laughs> Two years have passed since Brandy was in school. That Wednesday night, while sitting on her mother's couch, Brandy shares her anxiety about rejoining the Flag Corps. So she was kind of looking forward to meeting the new band members, but a little scared about meeting them, her being so much older than, than the others. She was a little anxious about that, um, hoping that she could do just as good a job on the Flag Corps as she did the previous years. With a passion for music, Brandy always found her way to center stage. She loved to sing. It was kind of a dream of hers to be a country singer. I think she felt that she just had to stand out a little bit more and uh, always put herself into to doing things that were, were grand. It wasn't enough just to be in the band. She had to be in the flag court, too. Brandy's dedication to music and in in the Flag Corps in high school earned her a college scholarship in 2001. The first part of her uh, freshman year at college, you would see Brandy outside with that flag in her hand and she would practice and practice and practice. She wouldn't give up until she caught on. seemed to have it all until she fell in love and got married. Suddenly, life got more complicated. 
she ended up getting married after her second year and she was supposed to head on to a, a major college and finish up her teaching uh, degree. Things are smooth at first, but eventually, Brandy is unable to juggle school, work, and family life. She decides it's best to put academics on hold. She kind of lost a little bit of her focus at the time. Then later, the marriage didn't work out. She ended up getting a divorce and then moved down to San Antonio. I think it was she went through a tough time, but she made it through and she had strength. And I'm not exactly sure where it came from. Two years after her divorce, she's determined to get her life back on track. She decided that she had let enough time pass. She needed to go back to school. But before she returns to school, there's one thing Brandy is intent on doing. She told me she was going to the club to meet some friends. So this was her one last chance to go out and have a little fun, kick it up. Brandy says she is going dancing with some friends. And she had asked her younger sister to go with her. And Georgia had decided not to go. Brandy made the decision to go ahead and go. Before going out that night, Brandy begs to borrow Ellen's car, since hers is low on gas. I knew the car that she was driving was not in the best of shape, and she asked me, well, can I borrow your car? And I told her, I don't have the gas either. She gave me a kiss on the cheek and walked out the door. That was it. Before Brandy gets to the club, a close family friend will give her a stern warning. And I told her, I said, Brandy, please just be very careful. I said, you, you just have no idea what's out there. It's 8 p.m., Wednesday, August 2nd, 2006. 23-year-old Brandy Wells has just left her mother's house for a night out on the town. Her mother believes she's going to the Electric Cowboy, a local club in Tyler. But Brandy has a different plan. First, she stops at a local bowling alley to have a drink and visit with the bartender and longtime family friend, Jeanette Green. She just came through the door, and of course, I immediately recognized Brandy. And uh, just smiling and sweet, and she sat down in front of me, and she said, uh, Jeanette, Mom, I could have a drink on her tab. I said, okay. She would drink a cherry vodka sour. She was very nonchalant. She just sat back and she propped herself up. She was drinking her drink and she would twirl her hair a little bit. Brandy then tells Jeanette her intentions. She's headed to a night spot she's never been to before. Graham Central Station, a popular East Texas club in a town 45 minutes away. For Jeanette, this news is quite unsettling. She tries to dissuade Brandy from going by herself. And I told her, I said, Brandy, please just be very careful. I said, you, you just have no idea what's out there. After 31 years of bartending, Jeanette has learned the hard way just how vulnerable young women are. Alone, over two decades ago. For Jeanette, the similarities are uncanny, right down to the bar stool Brandy's sitting on. That's why when Brandy was sitting in front of me, almost she could have been sitting side by side with Glenda. And I told her the same thing, and she had the same attitude. It made me angry. But Brandy is not about to change her plans. She has looked forward to this night for weeks, even if she ends up going alone. She had asked me if I would like to go to this nightclub over in Longview with her. And she wanted to go on a Wednesday night, which was ladies' night. And I told her that... I just couldn't go. With half her drink left on the bar, Brandy decides it's time to go. She came around and gave me a hug. And she walked through the door, and that was the last time I saw her. It's the morning after Brandy left Tyler dancing at a club in Longview. Longview, Texas is 
I guess you might say, um, kind of almost a halfway point between Dallas, Texas and, and Shreveport, Louisiana. The cities are connected by I-20, a highway dotted with truck stops and oil fields. Interstate 20 is a four-lane interstate that runs uh, from Tyler to approximately 20 miles to Longview. Uh, it's very rural. There's very few exits, uh, and there are very few businesses along that stretch of road. Sergeant Darren Lair, supervisor for the Criminal Investigations Division of the Longview Police Department, remembers when an abandoned car was first spotted on the highway. It was a 2000 Pontiac Black Grand Prix. A DPS trooper is driving down the interstate, and it's, it's on I-20. It's parked westbound just offside the road. The deputy runs the license plate numbers to make sure it's not a stolen vehicle. There's no police report filed, so there's no reason to know that there's anything wrong with the car and he puts a tag on it for an abandoned vehicle. The 2000 Black Pontiac Grand Prix sits on the side of the road, waiting to be claimed. Ellen Wells is just waking up to find her daughter Brandy has not come home from the night before. I woke up the next morning to get ready to go to work, and her, um, but she wasn't laying on the couch. Ellen figures Brandy had too much to drink and has crashed at a friend's house to avoid driving. Hours pass, and still no sign of her daughter. Her roommate called and asked if we had heard from Brandy or we had seen Brandy. She was supposed to be home that afternoon. I started to get a little worried, so I started calling her cell phone, and it would go straight to voicemail. You know, you don't think she's despaired. You know, you just think that she's 23 years old. She will come home when she's ready. So at that time, the warning bells still were not going off loudly in my head. By Friday morning, almost two days since Ellen has last spoken to Brandy, panic sets in. I just remember picking up the phone and, and Ellen was on the other end and she said, Michelle, Brandy didn't come home. And I said when and she said it's it's been two days this is our second day ellen and michelle call brandy's cell phone repeatedly praying she'll pick up you can hear tears in somebody's voice and you can hear tears in mine and michelle's voice on these phone calls and there is no way no way brandy would have ignored those after a grueling 48 hour wait Brandy's mother, Ellen, files a missing persons report with the Tyler police. It is only then that she learns where Brandy had gone that night. I was telling the police officer that Brandy went to the, the club and I named the club's name, and that's when Georgia stepped in and said, no, mother, she went to the club in Longview. This piece of vital information changes everything. Brandy's mother has always assumed Brandy had gone dancing at the local club in Tyler, where she had been many times. I was pretty mad. I didn't feel that Brandy had lied to me, but I felt that she had kept some important information from me. With this new lead, Ellen and Michelle split up to look for Brandy. Michelle, her thought was to get in the car and go to Longview and check the club out. When I pulled into the parking lot, it was a rather large parking lot. And I got out and... There was a remain that ran beside the club. So I walked over there and I just started searching the remain. And I really started panicking. My first instinct was to stay by the phone. The phone is my lifeline. That's how I get a hold of the police or how Brandy will get a hold of me. She's told the Longview police will be taking over. She needs to file yet another report. At first glance, the report that Brandy is missing does not seem alarming to the Longview police. On its face, the report itself appeared to be a fairly generic report that we get pretty regularly. Daughter came over to Longview, was going to go to a nightclub, hasn't come home yet. 
nothing's jumping out as there's a major problem here. But within the next 24 hours, the status of Brandy's case becomes anything but ordinary. The car that Brandy was driving is drawing more attention. Another citizen has driven by the car on the interstate and they call in to say, hey, this car's been out here a couple days. It's pretty strange. Maybe y'all want to come look at it. Of course, by this time now, there's a missing person report. The license plate is entered as belonging to a missing person. Finally, investigators are able to link the abandoned vehicle to Brandy Wells. When I got a call Tuesday, uh, that was one of the worst days um, because the first things out of their mouth was we found Brandy's car. And after the area where the car is found is searched, a piece of evidence finally emerges. Inside the car, we found a napkin with a name and a phone number. After five interminable days of filing reports and hoping for the best, Ellen Wells finally gets the news that her 23-year-old daughter's car has been found abandoned. We're on Interstate 20 westbound, about 500 yards or more from where you exit off the farm to market 2087. The car was located just off the shoulder of the road, kind of at an angle pointing off this way. There was no sign of a struggle. Uh, there was no sign of Brandy. The manner the car was found in relation to the missing persons report, we handled it right then as if we were dealing with any major crime scene, whether it be a homicide or anything else. The CSI team and the Diver Dogs are sent to the scene in search of any clues that could point to foul play. For Brandy's mother, this is a nightmare. To a mother having a 23-year-old daughter and you finding their car, that's kind of bad news because you don't know if there is a body in the trunk. You don't know if there is blood splattered all over the inside of that car. We're looking for hair, lip, fluids. Is there anything in the car that lets us know what was going on in that car when it was abandoned? We ran dogs on both sides of the interstate and up and down both hills when we did our search. When the dogs picked up no track down by the car itself, we came up here to where there's a frontage road and brought them up along both sides of this and ran them on both sides of the frontage road. The cadaver dogs did not hit on anything. Investigators do their best, but one troubling factor overshadows their efforts. When you have a missing person, those first 24 or 48 hours, that, that is the time where everything is still fresh. By the time we had the dogs out to track when we found the car, it had already rained. It, there had been countless people walking up and down the interstate, countless cars going through, taking those scents and going wherever with them. The Longview Police Department needs all the help they can get. They turn to the FBI for assistance. Special Agent Millslagle is the case advisor. And that really concerned us that we weren't going to be able to put this together because we were already behind on the timeline. We probably lost about 20 to 24 hours in this timeline in this case. And by losing 24 hours, you're backtracking. With time not on their side, the forensics team tries to piece together the facts. Details emerge, causing them to fear the worst. So while we were on the scene, there, there were some things that led us to believe this is not just a car that broke down. We had found the car and thought it might have been a, a carjacking, that she may have been abducted uh, out of her vehicle and the vehicle abandoned shortly thereafter. The position of the driver's seat in Brandy's car is what really sounds the alarm. Brandy was right around five feet tall, not a very tall girl, and the seat was pushed all the way back. My husband is six foot two and he was able to crawl into that car and would have been able to drive it very comfortably. There's no way Brandy could have driven that car. Her legs would not have reached the pedals. Perhaps most unnerving is where on I-20 the car is discovered. The car was about 500, 400, 500 yards. Like I said, 
like it was headed back towards Tyler. Although pointed in the right direction, Brandy's car is found a few miles before the entrance ramp she should have taken to go back home. It's very hard to understand how her car might have gotten to that location unless either she was just lost or if somebody... And also fuel cause for concern. Brandy's purse was in the vehicle. Um, along with a cell phone that we believe to be her cell phone. And there's not many women in their young 20s that are going to run off without their purse and their cell phone. The angle at which the car was left, with the driver's door ajar and the keys missing, is equally perplexing. Did it run out of gas and so we coasted off and that's why it's kind of pointed off at this angle towards the, the embankment or the ditch or what have you? Or was somebody in a hurry to get out of it and just got off the road as fast as they could. Investigators know Brandy was low on gas. As the car is processed, police find two questionable objects to suggest Brandy's fears of running out of gas may have driven her into the hands of a stranger. If she was trying to walk to a gas station, she was a very good distance from a gas station. We did find a gas can in the trunk of the car. Nobody close to Brandy remembers her ever owning a gas can thought that very unusual because Brandy was not the most prepared person in the world. Investigators are unable to determine whether or not the gas can had been recently used. Did she run out of gas and get picked up by a trucker or did she meet somebody at the club that we don't know about and they were following her? This last theory is more than just a hunch. A second piece of evidence found in Brandy's car leads investigators to question a witness who sheds light on Brandy's last known actions. Inside the car, we found a napkin with a name and a phone number. We called the phone number. Sure enough, he was at the club and was very willing to come forward and tell us what he knew uh, about his interaction with Brandy that night. According to police reports, the witness offered to buy Brandy a drink, but she declined. He recalls in detail what she was wearing, a floral blouse with dark pants, and their peculiar conversation. He had met her at the club, uh, talking a typical nightclub encounter, if you will. Uh, the thing he mentioned specifically was that she was, if not directly asking for money, that she was making it clear that she needed money for gas. And uh, they spoke briefly, and then they parted with their separate ways. This leaves investigators wondering, might Brandy have asked others for help that night? Police turn their focus to the nightclub, Graham Central Station. There's video surveillance at the club, both outside and over the counter where you come in. Also, when you come into the club, you have to swipe your driver's license. Wednesday after Brandy disappeared, the Longview police contacted us and told us that they were getting the club footage uh, that night and needed us to come down and pick Brandy out um, among all of the club goers. Security at the club confirms Brandy swiped her license at 10.44 p.m. on Tuesday, August 2nd. Investigators are now looking for visual evidence in the surveillance footage to see if Brandy arrived or left the club with anyone that night. We had a general time frame and a general clothing description of what Brandy was wearing. We found a woman come into the club that appeared to be wearing very similar to what Brandy was wearing. The time frame was very close. So they went through and they found the time that Brandy's driver's license was swiped. Um, and they looked at the video uh, and the timestamp on the video showed this one young lady standing on the front porch uh, speaking with uh, two gentlemen. This is the break police have been waiting for. Now they can ask the public for help in identifying the men they believe were with Brandy that night. It is a very tight-knit community. A lot of people know everybody else's business, and uh, everything is played out in the media on the, the front page of the newspaper every morning. But first, they need a positive ID from the family to make sure the woman in question is in fact Brandy. Brandy's godmother, sister, and sister-in-law go to the station to have a look at the tapes. It was a top view 
so it was very hard to see. The hair color was the same, the length was the same, the body shape was the same. I went ahead and said that it could be Brandy. Brandy's story breaks on the evening news that same night. This security photo shows her with one of the men inside Graham Central Station. Then just minutes later, this photo shows her with another man outside. But we would like to get a hold of this gentleman to find out if he's got any information, if, if she met somebody up there inside the club already or what. We just have no idea. Ten days later, Brandy's mother will be shocked when she finds out that the cell phone taken from the car Brandy was driving is not her daughter's. They showed me the cell phone, and I told them that that was not Brandy's cell phone. Get more disappeared online at investigationdiscovery.com. are doing everything in their power to find the missing woman. Yet they have few answers. Surveillance video showing what appears to be Brandy and two unknown males has been released to the media. While investigators wait for more leads, Brandy's family decides the waiting game is over. We did the uh, chain email. Um, we contacted every newspaper. I contacted every TV station in Tyler, in Longview, and as far east as Shreveport. Uh, we wanted to get the story out. We want it to where uh, every corner of the United States, she is known, uh, people are on the lookout for her. Brandy's story continues to run on the local news. Brandy's mother shares one detail she finds particularly unsettling. Some of her personal belongings, such as a cell phone, was found in the vehicle. The police did say that when they found her car, they found her cell phone. They also told me that they had called several people in the address book on the cell phone, and some people knew Brandy and some did not, and I thought that was kind of weird. The cell phone issue doesn't go away. When Brandy's mother drives to Longview to give investigators a sample of Brandy's DNA, she ends up giving them a piece of information that will take the investigation in a very different direction. I gave them a DNA sample, and they showed me the cell phone, and I told them that that was not Brandy's cell phone. That did not look like the cell phone that I remember Brandy having. The cell phone police recovered from the vehicle did not belong to Brandy at all but to an ex-boyfriend who is now serving in Iraq. And it was indeed his cell phone and not hers that they had in their possession. For 10 days, police have been tracking the wrong cell phone calls. So when we find out that her actual active cell phone is, is gone, now we start thinking, okay, well maybe she is just somewhere where she wants to be. So we began the process of getting a subpoena for the phone records. While police and the FBI are waiting for the subpoenaed records, Ellen and Michelle are busy doing their own police work. They contact Brandy's friend, who shared a cell phone contract with her, and ask to send them a copy of the records. What they find is shocking. I believe it started a week after Brandy disappeared. That there was call after call after call after call that lasted one, maybe two minutes. To me, it had the tone of a drug user or deal. about her calls. Suspicious activity does not start until the 11th of August, nine days after Brandy's last call. At this point in the investigation, we, we clearly have more than just a missing person who doesn't want to be seen. We had already made a call to the FBI, made them aware of what we were looking at, um, started coordinating our efforts. Investigators are able to trace the suspicious calls back to two individuals who were brought in for questioning. We interviewed those folks, which led us to a person of interest who allegedly used the telephone uh, that was owned by Brandy Wells. From what I understand, his story is that he was walking down the road a week after Brandy disappeared, and he heard a beeping and looked over, and lo and behold, there 
cell phone there. He finds the cell phone in a bad area of town. He uh, gave a, at least two, maybe three different stories, all somewhat similar, uh, but none of them exactly the same. He was offered a FBI administered polygraph examination, which he declined, and he remains a person of interest today. I do believe he knows more about the circumstances about which he found the phone than what he's willing to tell us, but I, other than he was at one point in possession of the phone, I have no way and no reason to say he could have had anything to do with, uh, with Brandy's disappearance. With no hard evidence tying this individual directly to Brandy, investigators must wait for a break. Meanwhile, the question looms on everyone's mind. How did her cell phone get from the nightclub to Longview's rough south side of town? It's one of those places you got to mean to go there to to end up there. Um, It is in a very high crime area. Uh, It is an area known for crack cocaine trafficking. It's not an area that you would have ever thought Brandy Wells would have been of her own. When police analyze where the cell phone is found, in relation to where Brandy's car was abandoned, a plausible theory emerges. You could drive only about four blocks from where the phone was found, and when you got to that road, if you took it, it would become Farm to Market 2087, which would take you right out to exit on I-20 where the car was found. Without further physical evidence, the trail once again turns cold, six weeks after Brandy's disappearance. But her mother isn't giving up. She keeps looking at the surveillance tape. Something's not right. I expressed my concerns about the outfit that the girl was wearing was not the outfit that Brandy had on. The more Ellen Wells looks, the more she is certain that the young woman she sees in the footage is not Brandy. The last moments Ellen spent with her daughter on August 2nd, 2000... Uh, came out and asked me how I thought she looked, and I told her she looked adorable. If Brandy had not come out and asked me, I probably would not have paid as much attention to it. Brandy's aunt, Ollie Cormier, has yet to see the tape. She's uncomfortable with her sister's doubt and would like to see for herself. Ollie and her husband get a copy of the tape. Within minutes, her husband spots Brandy, and it's not the same police originally thought was her. She's able to spot the actual footage of Brandy coming into the club and Brandy leaving the club. While investigators were looking for a girl coming into the club at 1044, surveillance cameras capture Brandy arriving earlier at 1035. The timestamp on the cameras was off by 10 minutes. Brandy walks into the club 10 minutes before this girl by herself. My first thought was, that's There she is, and there are the clothes that I insisted to the police that she had on that night. Investigators can now confirm Brandy's last known actions the night she went missing. The surveillance tapes indicate that she entered the club, uh, presented her driver's license, and then a few hours later left the club. Both times, entering and leaving, she was alone. We wasted six weeks concentrating on somebody that wasn't even my daughter. So we're led to believe that she was not with anybody at that time, had a good time at the club, left on her own free will, and then something happened after she left that club. But what Brandy does before walking out of the shot leaves room for speculation. As she was leaving, all you can see is her feet. She headed off towards the right, I believe, and then you see her turn and go towards the left. Did somebody yell at her, holler at her, somebody she'd met in the club, or matter was there just somebody over there that she took a look at i don't know without cameras in the club's parking lot or witnesses coming forward claiming to have seen brandy leaving the club that night investigators are left with unanswered questions it's a month and a half later brandy's family is getting desperate they turn to the outside for help september 19th of 2006 we got a call from brandy's family in regards to brandy brandy disappeared on or about August 2nd of 2006. Bob Walcott, executive director of the Laura Recovery Center, a nonprofit organization that helps families locate their missing loved ones, agrees to take on Brandy's case. And uh, by uh, 26th of September, then, we were on our way up to Longview and got a search going. The first search that we did, we had two locations. We had the area right near the 
that was going to be searched. They brought them in in droves and also got volunteers locally, four-wheelers, horses, uh, cadaver dogs. We were fortunate in the sense that we had a starting point and an ending point where we knew the car ended up. The strategy is to eliminate the areas in between with the hope that nothing will be found. These areas would make sense if, if you were going to have abducted and killed somebody and possibly buried them. This road looks like it joins up an apartment complex behind here. And then from that apartment complex and this road, we've got another wooded area a little farther back. All of this is right behind the nightclub where Brandy was when she disappeared. I was thinking at the time of that search that we could just find her, find something of her. Pretty much found absolutely nothing. I didn't find a, a blonde hair anywhere, so to speak. Um, so I knew we're going to have to try it again. Ellen Wells will learn troubling news when police discover the body of a young woman apparently burned. I can see Brandy's face in that skull. It's been six long weeks. Police are finally able to piece together a timeline of the events leading up to the disappearance of Brandy Wells. A promising lead has turned cold when investigators are unable to connect an individual who claimed to have found Brandy's phone to her actual disappearance. Then, the body of an unidentified young woman is found only seven miles from where Brandy's car was abandoned. During the course of this investigation, there was a body discovered in an oil well site just outside of Kilgore, Texas. It's an area recognized for its oil fields, only 11 miles from Longview. The lady was found burning. Her face was burned beyond recognition, but traces of her clothing remained. Blue jeans and a long-sleeved sweater. Of course, Brandy was not wearing them at the time, but it was a few months after Brandy disappeared. Once they sent it to autopsy and they were able to start narrowing down the characteristics of the body, it comes back that it's a white female, and it was close enough that we thought there was a distinct possibility that, that could have been Brandy. The woman's skull is given to a forensic artist to be reconstructed. It looked wax and fake, but just looking in the picture, I could see Brandy's face in that skull. Just knowing how this woman's body was desecrated, is difficult for Brandy's family and friends. I was extremely upset because the body was found burning. It was still on fire when they found it. All kinds of horrible things were going through my mind. Seeking answers, Ellen Wells hands over Brandy's dental records to the authorities, and they are not a match. She now has definitive proof that the burned body is not her daughter. To this day, she still has not been identified. How can a body lay around for two and a half years and nobody want to claim her? You also think that, my God, how could somebody actually set fire to a human being? Could they have done this to her too? As the holidays draw near, Family and close friends are determined to bring Brandy home. In December of 2006, we came down and did a second search. The Laura Recovery Center agrees to come back to Longview to resume searching the area where they had left off back in September. I wanted to do it around a time of year that held significance. Um, not only was it Thanksgiving, it was her birthday. At that point, they would be looking for a body. Uh, nobody really wants to say that. Taking time off work, I'm taking my vacation around Christmas to search a wooded area for my best friend. It was very surreal. Janelle Midkiff has been in a state of disbelief since she heard the news of Brandy's disappearance. Searching for her best friend brings back bittersweet memories. Brandy and I were one. We were 
teenagers inseparable. When the girls were teenagers, they spent seven days a week together at Bethel Baptist Church and attended church camps in the summer. As Janelle looks to the cold ground for remains of her friend, that seems like a lifetime ago. Reality hits home when she stumbles on a bag filled with bones. My first initial thought when I saw this bag was, I hope this isn't Brady. But at the same time, if it was, we can, we can bring her home. We come to the conclusion that it was an animal in the bag and not human remains. As the second ground search nears an end, once again... A stack of needles because there's just, there's so much area without a, a, a specific place and an idea of exactly where you need to concentrate. You're just doing what you can and hoping to get lucky. Hope is all that remains for Brandy's mother, who is determined to keep the search for her daughter alive. Brandy's mother has just lived it for the last two years, every day. She's done everything she can to find her daughter. I'll be damned if I'm gonna stop looking for her until I can hopefully find her. But with all the will in the world, no one is able to say what happened when Brandy stepped off the front porch of Graham Central Station that night in Longview. The atypical nature of this case has stumped investigators. Usually there's something about the missing person's lifestyle that lends them to that missing status, and that's one of the troubling things about this case is that it doesn't fit with her. She was not running from anything. She was not hiding from anything. She would not have disappeared on her own. At this point, the case is still considered active, but there are no new leads to speak of. The importance of keeping a spotlight on Brandy's story is critical for her family. I drive around with Brandy's missing posters in my car and one on the front windshield and one on the back windshield. Because what if someone driving down the road beside me is the only person that saw Brandy but doesn't watch the news? That could be the one person that could tell us something. Someone out there saw Brandy after she left the club and that person needs to come forward, let us know so we can put an end to the investigation and put some answers in the family of Brandy Wells as to what happened that night in Longview. All you can do is sit there and pray to God that one day somebody will come forward with what they know and give us a road to go down. I don't have any suspects. I don't have any clues. I don't have any solid of anything. The only thing solid is that Brandy's gone. For Ellen Wells, this surveillance video is all she has to remember her daughter's last known steps on that fateful summer night. It's exactly what she looked like the last time I have seen her face. And um, it's probably silly and stupid, but any time I want to see her in action, instead of just looking at a still picture, I'll have a, a moving picture of her. See her still alive.